we're going to look at financial statement analysis. So the purpose of financial statement analysis is to enable finance students to be able to evaluate a firm's performance. This could be present, past, and future performance. It is also important that you have a comparative analysis across time within the company itself, which we call intra-company, between companies, which we call intercompany, and against industry averages. And so we're going to take you through some analytical tools that will help you obtain useful information for decision making. The users of finance documents are number one, the shareholders. So we'll look at the shareholders ratios and how they will help them make decisions. Number two, we have the managers. The managers will use this information to help them uh, make decisions for internal use. Mm -hmm. We'll look at the efficiency ratios and activity ratios to give them a picture of how they've been performing with regards to the assets they have and the stock. We're also going to look at other key um, users of finance information who are the creditors. They will be interested to in finding out how you as a company are liquid enough to finance or to pay their short-term debt instruments short-term debts in short. So we're going to look at um, the reasons why organizations exist. The first is that they exist for survival. And under survival, we have two key principles. For them to survive, they must be able to uh, generate excess revenues or income or expenses for that approach. So the statement analysis will be able to calculate the profitability of an organization and that we call the profitability ratios. So we're going to look at about five profitability ratios, which include the net profit, the cost profit margin, the return on assets, the return on capital employed, and also the return on equity. All these fall under what we call the profitability ratios. Then under survival, we'll also be interested to finding out the solvency. Whenever we're dealing with solvency, we are looking at ability to meet our debt obligation. So it is important that a firm is able to meet its short-term debt obligations. Now, in the theory part, you must also be able to uh, define the different business structures that we have. We have a sole trader, we have a partnership, we have a company. And we know that a sole trader is a one-man business. And this one-man business is one where the individual owner assumes the whole decision-making and responsibility. Of course, he can hire one or two people to work for him. But in a sole proprietor, we have unlimited liability. And this unlimited liability, it means the debts that this individual who is a sole trader are as far as individual property. And so should there be any debt, a creditor can touch as much as he has. Advantages are that there are prompt decisions made and here there's no profit sharing. And the only tax he pays is just a personal income tax. He doesn't pay any corporate tax. We also have another business entity, which we call the partnership, governed by partnership deed, which can either be written or verbal. Of course, the written is more durable and more, more, um, uh, effective. So in the partnership deed is stipulated how the profits will be shared and how each of the shareholders who are the partners in this case will be accorded responsibilities. And in this kind of business, we know that there are active partners and the passive partners. The active partners do the daily running of the business. And the advantages are that this kind of business pools resources together it also pulls uh, expertise together. The disadvantages are that it is prone to internal conflict and also has unlimited liability. We graduate to what we call a company. A company can be split into two. We have a private and a public limited company. We know that a private limited company ends with LTD, whereas a public PLC. The difference between the main two is that one can trade publicly on a stock exchange, whereas the other cannot. And so 
a limited company is protected by law because it has a separate legal entity, meaning it can sue and be sued. And there are constituents of these, um, this company that we need to know. We have what we call the shareholders who buy in a proportion of ownership in the business. The kinds of shareholders that are in this kind of business are two. We have the preference and the ordinary shareholders. The preference shareholders are also called speculative investors who only invest in a business primarily just to reap a return. And so these ones are not equity holders, we call them prior debt owners. And so they're considered slightly as creditors to the company. Whereas the owners of this business are the ordinary shareholders who have the voting rights. And so a return on a share is called a dividend. And as such, we're going to now understand how these people are keen to a national statement analysis. So if you're taking corporate finance, if you're taking financial management, if you're taking financial accounting, this is a topic that you need to know, not only for academic purposes, but also for personal reasons. Are we together so far? So we're going to go down to just look at the kinds of ratios under ratio analysis. A ratio is simply a measure between two or more uh, periods of time or more figures. So we're going to look at the five kinds of ratios that we will be keen to knowing. Firstly, is what we call a liquidity ratio. Secondly, we have what we call the profitability ratio. Thirdly, we have what we call the debt ratios, the efficiency or activity ratios. So financial ratio analysis will really involve us calculating and analyzing a ratio which makes use of one data or two more financial statements. So when we analyze these relationships, we'll be able to understand whether we are making progress or we are retrogressing as a business. So there are five categories that we need to know. We talked about the liquidity or solvency ratios. These ones basically show how a firm is performing in terms of its ability to meeting their short-term de short debt obligations. We also have what we call the profitability ratios, which gauge the firm's ability to making more sales over expenses. They look at how the firm's profit is based on the investments made by the shareholders and the investments out of the management of the business through the sales. We also have what we call efficiency ratios. These ones just look at how efficient we are utilizing our assets to generate sales. The leverage ratios exactly tell us how much we are indebted. They give us the extent to which the firm is financed by debt and by equity. And finally, we have what we call the shareholders ratios or the investment ratios or the investor ratios. They show the performance of the investment that has been put in by the actual owners of the business. So we're going to look at the formulas that are there. Now I plead with you that these formulas are easier than any other course, so you need to know them. Firstly, I'll mention the ratios that fall under each of these uh, categorized ratios. Under the liquidity ratio, we have two. So I'll go through the ratios and their formulas, and I'll ask you to give me. We were given a financial statement in groups that you needed to analyze. And this financial statement may come in an exam where you're asked to just choose any ratios that you, you know or you're conversant with. So these formulas may not be given, so you need to know. So we go to what we call the liquidity ratios. We have two, the current and the quick. The current ratio is simply the current assets divided by the current liabilities. When we go to the quick ratio, it is simply the current assets minus the stock divided by the current liabilities. We also have the cash ratio, which has a cash equivalent divided by the current liabilities. The difference between these two is that one doesn't have inventory or stock. It is called the quick ratio because it is used by creditors to immediately meet their debt obligations. Stock is so difficult to convert into cash and as such, most of the creditors would rather want you to either look at the cash at the bank, the cash at hand, or the prepayments you made since it could easily be reversed 
or peradventure if you have any data cash uh, in terms of inventory it will be difficult to convert and we have the efficiency ratios or activity ratios they are also about four or five just mentioned by the few we have inventory turnover which simply gives you a picture of um, how long it takes for us to sell our stock the longer the more deadly the quicker the better the receivable turnover simply is also called the data turnover which talks about the period of time it takes for you to do what to pay your debt it's also called the data's payment period uh, okay the last one is there uh, we have what we call the uh, payable turnover, which is simply the creditor's payable period. So the formulas are as follows. Inventory turnover is the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. When you look at the receivable turnover, it's simply the cost of sales divided by the average account receivable or the total data. Then we have the uh, payable turnover, it's simply the credit purchases over the creditors. And when we go to the total asset and over, we simply have our revenues divided by our average total assets. Now you agree with me that when you go through other books, the formulas are slightly different, but um, they all give something uh, significant and worth uh, reporting on. So depending on what you're given, all of them are valid, what book you're using. Then we also have what we call the leverage ratios. They include the debt to equity ratio, the debt ratio, and the interest cover. These ones are as given in the formulas. So the debt uh, leverage ratios, we have the debt ratio, which is given by the abilities divided by the total assets. The long-term debt to equity gives you long-term debt divided by our owner's equity. This basically looks at how much the comparison is between how much we borrowed and how much we have. Then finally, the profitability ratios, which we have are uh, five. We have the gross profit margin, which is simply gross profit divided by sales times 100. Net profit margin, we simply have the net profit over our net profit before interest and tax times 100. So it's a net profit before interest and tax over the sales times 100. Then we have the return on equity, which is simply the net profit for interest and tax divided by the average equity. Any questions this far? Are we together? Okay. So a quick, can you remember? I need you to tell me the five ratios that we have and um, if possible, some of the formulas that we would remember. What are some of the ratios that we've just discussed just now? Number one. Mm, under liquidity ratios, mm -hmm. we have the current ratio mm -hmm. as well as the quick ratios. And the last one, there are three. Uh, I think I didn't get the third one. Somebody help the out. Current ratio. Uh -huh. The current ratio. Uh huh. Yeah. Current ratio. The quick ratio and the what? Cash ratio. Okay, great. So give me uh, the formulas. So she started with the liquidity ratios. We have the current ratio. What is the formula for the current ratio? Uh, current, current assets. Current liabilities. Current assets over current liabilities. And assets of account and liabilities. Correct. So, what is the benchmark for this one? Two to one. For every two assets we have, we should have one liability. Which other ratio do we have under the liquidity ratios? Quick ratio, which is given by what? ratio uh, is equal to current assets, mm -hmm. less inventory mm -hmm. over current liabilities. Correct. Then our cash ratio. Uh-huh. Is given by what? 
is equal to cash divided by current liabilities. Excellent. Cash and cash equivalents divided by the current liabilities. Are we together? So just before I proceed to the other ratios, we're going to look at uh, this financial statement. I want you to help me calculate these three ratios we've talked about. So based on the first ratios we've talked about, uh, we have our uh, statement of financial performance, and also we have the statement of financial position. So can somebody identify when we're dealing with the current, uh, the liquidity ratios, we're dealing with the balance sheet. So how do we calculate our um, current um uh ratio here what figures are we going to pick current ratio uh -huh. need you to be able to identify um which the 20 the, the ladies will be looking at the 2010 and the gents will be looking at 2011. So for the first current ratio, we'll pick um, 1020.1 1 okay. divided by. So we're looking at current assets of our current liabilities, right? So our current assets is yes. what? 1000. And twenty. It's actually five seventy four. That's that the one you're picking the total assets. So the one she's picking are total assets. So mm -hmm. it's five seventy four point three. Okay. So you see the correction. You are picking something wrong. This is total assets. So we have five one. Oh yeah, thanks. Seventy four. Okay. So divided by what? 321.8 divided by 321.8. Where is the 321.8 coming from? The current what? Uh, liabilities. Is she right? Yes, she is. <clears throat> Okay, the same figures will be collected for our 2020, 2011 ratios, just quickly to go, so that we redeem time. So the current ratio is simply current assets of current liabilities, so the 574 over 521, so we have the uh, 1.78 for 2010, then we go to 2011 and divide those two constituents, we're going to get what? 1.705. So of course the acceptable is two, but still this is also okay because we have more assets than we do have liabilities. Then when we go to the quick asset test or the quick ratio, we subtract inventory. So here the inventory aspect was subtracted. So the benchmark was one to one, but here we have 0 0.85 to 0 0.69. So we performed better in 2010 than we did in 2011. So the reason mainly would have been because we we're holding too much um, inventory. So this is more than just what interpreting figure uh, figures. You also need to give an analytical perspective of what is causing a decline. So you can see here we have a, a inventory which is 300, but in this year we had more inventory, and this is what affects the quick ratio. So we can also uh, make a comment on the just the uh, the, the 
the current ratio. So this is financial statement analysis. So you need to also make what? Uh, a comment. So if you're commenting to say the current ratio was what? 1.7821 in 2010, and there was 1.7021. These ones are above the acceptable. They are above acceptable levels, but below the ideal. The ideal is two to one, okay? So they're above acceptable because acceptable is that at least there should be more what? More of the assets than the liabilities. And when we go to the quick ratios, the comment is that quick ratios appear to be more of a concern. They are both below what? They're acceptable. They're below one to one in both years. So there should be good what? Inventory management, especially in 20 what? In 20. 10 because they were holding too much of inventory. So this is how we interpret that. Are we together? Are we together? So can somebody yes. take us through another yes, ratio? Please. Yes, please. What does, what does it mean? Two to one? What does it mean? Two to one. All right. Since we know that our current ratio is simply our current assets, of our current liabilities. So if we have assets that are 10,000, meaning our liabilities should be like 5,000. But when we get the ratio there, 5,000 there is one, 5,000 there is two. So this is the ratio two to one, all right? So it means for every two assets, there should be one current liability. This is the ideal. But it's still fine, even if you're going to have a 6,000 year, as long as it's more than, if you're going to get one point something. It is below, this is the industry acceptable. We should have double, in short, assets than we have liabilities. Is that clear? Sure, it is, thank you. All right, any yes. other questions? Okay, so let's go to another ratio. Can somebody give us another ratio that they remember? Profitability ratio. Who remembers of profitability ratios? What ratios do we have there? Profitability ratios, can somebody help us remember? Um, so there's gross profit margin. Profitability ratio, we have what? GPM, gross profit margin, correct? Which other ratio do we have? NPF. Net profit margin, yes. ROE, which is return on capital. Return on equity, correct. So, what is the formula for gross profit margin? Gross profit by revenue or sales. Correct. Gross profit divided by what? The sales times 100. All right. Mm -hmm. Next, net profit margin. So it's a net profit, you, are, you divide it by the revenue as well. Okay, what net profit are we looking at? After tax or before tax? After. After tax or before tax? I think it's before. before. Before tax, yes, it's supposed to be before interest in tax. Excellent. Yes, then um, before interest in tax, very important because you get confused in the two profits. Then the return on equity, return on capital employed. Net profit by uh, the owner's equity. Okay, net profit by the owner's equity uh, or the total assets. That's why I say, depending on the book that you're using, or either of them will be okay. The return on capital employed is the net profit before interest and tax over what? The total assets. That's 100. All right. So at least you're not uh, mandated to know all the ratios, at least two in each of them, minimum. It's important. So when we go to our, our statement here, the net profit 
obviously comes from there. Um, comprehensive statement. So in the comprehensive statement, you also often be given an industry average. So here, there's no benchmark, but there's a benchmark which comes from the industry. So at this point, when you go here, you will look through net profit over sales. That is a gross profit margin. So we go to what is our net profit? Our gross profit, our gross profit is what? 495. Then our sales have 2240. So times 100, we get 22.10. Our industry average is 25. So this is below. We also go to 2011. Our um, gross profit is 609 and our net profit is 2681. So when you calculate this as a percentage, we get 22%. This one is slightly below average, it's on its way. All of them are below average. Okay. We go to our net profit margin. It's a net profit before interest and tax. So which of the two do we pick? A or B? We pick what A. So we pick 219 over our sales, which is 2240. Then here pick 240 over 2681. When you calculate this net profit margin, this one is giving us 9.79 and this one is giving us 8.95. So these ones are or above the industry average. So you can tell that you are performing above the industry. All right, then we go to the return on capital employed. We have our net profit for interest and tax, which is 219 over our total assets. The total assets are found from, they've extracted in the what? In the balance sheet. Uh, figure that our colleague had given us that on the total assets. We know where to extract it, isn't it? it comes from the summation of the current assets and the uh, non-current assets. So we calculate that. So we get our um, our return on capital employed. Are there any questions so far? Are we moving together? Are there any questions? Are we moving together? Yes. Anyone behind? Okay, so we go end on on. The other uh, ratios are from the financial structure. The debt to equity ratio is debt over equity. So debt over equity, we need to have more equity than we do have uh, uh, debt for us to see how we are capitalized, how the capital structure is. So when we calculate, we have 0 0.4, for 2010, we have 0.09 for 2011. So we also have uh, benchmarks that we need to follow. The return on equity, the return on uh, uh, capital employed, the liquidity ratios, they have standards. So all these, we just need to follow uh, the formula that I've given you. So now this is a summary of the, the figures that should or could be calculated. I won't go through all of them due to time. I'll ask you to go through this slide at your own time, but I'm really interested in your understanding how to interpret. So if you're going to look at our benchmark for profit, gross profit margin, you'll see that here we have 22 and here we have 22.7. Both are below what? The industry benchmark. Net profit, this one's slightly above and this one is below. So this one did perform better. Then we'll go to the return on assets where proof percent as a benchmark, both of them are above this one and this one. Return on equity, both of them were above, except that 2010 was far, far too good. Then when we go to inventory turnover, inventory looks at the number of times we restock, we sell our stock. Six times the benchmark, this was 5.8, this was 5.58. Then the asset turnover was not given. You can just compare the performances between the two. We are 2.2 and 2.53. The liquidity ratios, the standard is 2.1 and 1.1, which is acceptable. So all of them are above the 
acceptable, but below the ideal. And the quick ratio same, this is the ideal, the acceptable one, and both of them will be low. And the payable periods are given a standard of 30 days within a month, they should be able to pay. So the creditors uh, uh, payback period for 2010 uh, when given the purchases, so it was not possible. But these ones for 2011, we are paying 49 days. So meaning we took longer. Then when we go to the debt to equity ratio, the industry is 0 0.6 to 1, or the standard benchmark is 1 to 1. This is above, this is below. This one is a uh, times interest end. We're told that three to five is acceptable, below three is risky, above five is very favorable. So this is above five, and this is also above five. So this was a very good report where interest is concerned. Then you give your report with the key custodians of uh, this financial information. So you can now analyze it to start with the investors considering purchasing shares in this company. Why? Because the return they will uh, expect in this gives a better picture how, starting with each individual ratio. So looking at the return on equity, we had 26%. This uh, was uh, perceived to be a risky investment. Above, it was attractive because the current bank rates were uh, favorable. The return on equity, however, decreased by 4% from 26, um, the cent, which was better than the industry. Of course, this was uh, compared to the 30% of the other. So you present an expectation that the return on the equity that whoever wants to buy this company will get would be good because it's above the industry or the, uh, with 20%. Then riskiness here is being reduced significantly because of the repayment that was uh, on the loan. So certain decrease in performances may not necessarily be bad, but because of one or two ingredients that you would have noticed, especially you need to take account of the loans. So they could have performed better, except that for 2011, they're paying a loan, which reduced what our ability to have a higher ROI. Under profitability, you also comment in terms of the net profit, gross profit um, margin. So the net profit here, we are told that it went downward by 2% in this period. And the return on equity shows a significant uh, decrease, but it's still better than the industry. And when you go to the gross profit margin, it was unfavorable by 2.3, which the benchmark was uh, 25, so meaning we had about uh, 22.7, somewhere there, so we went below. However, using the horizontal analysis, there was a deep increase by that 4%. So you can use both analysis, either the horizontal and the ratio analysis to also counter check whether we were also performing better. In asset management, looking at uh, inventory turnover, we are told that it went slightly down from 5.8 to 5.5 times, but it is too close to the six times of the benchmark because we're supposed to sell to six times in a year but we only sold 5.8 times and then the other year to 5.58 times. However, you could also make a recommendation that the sales department must uh, ensure that they uh, do more promotions of these products so that we sell more times. When you go to liquidity ratios, I explained also regarding how the benchmark would be. So this I already did explain. And finally, under the financial structure, the uh, debt equity ratio, the industry benchmark is 0 0.67 to 1. But the business became a little bit risky because of that loan repayment. So the tie, which was extremely good, we had 39, uh, almost 40 times against the benchmark of 5. So meaning this gave a very good pitch. And finally, give recommendations. What are recommendations? We're looking at the plastic making company. So you can focus that the industry looks good due to the demand that is ahead in the industry. And the sales growth is promising. They're all acceptable ratios that are either close to industry averages or above. The good cash flows also from activities being end will give a picture. So you can recommend that the investor can purchase the shares in this company. So basically what I've done is just to give you a snippet of how analysis must be done on the financial statement analysis.
want to get everything I've mentioned, you're able to get 25 marks for the interpretation. I'll send you this slide so that you could go through all that I've mentioned. Unless there are any questions, you could ask now.